I have the pleasure to uh, open this day and, um, and welcome you all on behalf of the, the ABV, which is the impossible Dutch acronym for what we could also call the Dutch Association of Anthropologists. And that's what's bringing us all together, right? Uh, my name is Nikki Wiegink. I work at the uh, Cultural Anthropology Department at Utrecht University. And I organize this day together with Marcus Balkenhol from the Meertens Institute and who deserves actually um, way more credit than I do for this day. Um, but I stood at this podium three years ago, uh, basically around the same time, to open the day of Dutch anthropology, uh, also then. And that year the theme was futures, the future of anthropology and the anthropology of the future. And it, it shows how bad anthropologists are at predicting the future. <laughs> as we were then blissfully ignorant of, uh, of several of the crises that, that were ahead of us. And to our own credit, we did discuss the climate crisis, of course, but at the time we did not foresee the, I think that you could say the intensity, or some people perhaps did foresee it, um, but of this other crisis that is the focus of today, and that is a crisis of truth. And um, the COVID 19 pandemic, the climate crisis, and now the war in Ukraine. But also to make things worse, my own Facebook timeline that is modeling up with banalities like the court dispute between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, <laughs> all in, in their own ways bring to light a crisis of truth. And as we wrote in the conference notes, data, scientific facts, democracy, the secular, nature, and the human itself are now competing with increasingly aggressive alternative realities or alternative facts. And, and more than ever, scholars find themselves challenged to respond to attacks that question the very foundations of their, of their work. And of course, questioning truth is not new. The rise of constructivist paradigms has questioned the sciences as producers of facts. But what does this mean in a post-truth era? What does it mean to, to understand truth and knowledge as, as contested fields of power relations? And, and what does speaking to truth mean in a post-truth era? And, and what is the role of anthropological critique and of deconstruction? And I think the keynote will speak to that and to, to much more. And in relation to, to this, there's this idea that we should follow the science, right? But, but which science to follow? And one of the, the panels will, will speak to that. And what does, does this mean for research practices, for accessibility to scientific knowledge? Who has access to knowledge? And, one of, and the other panel this afternoon will, will address this question. So the, these and many other questions, of course, uh, will guide us through this day. Um, we have set up this, this program with ABV board members, with, with colleagues and with students. And uh, as you can see in the program, well, we will start with the keynote in this beautiful hall. Um, then we will have a lunch break, which will be downstairs. Then uh, there will be two panels, so you can basically choose uh, where you want to go. One of the panel sessions will be held here, and the other one will be in uh, the small room, the Kleine Zaal, which is at the back of this one. And then um, in the afternoon, we will end the day with a round table again here, and uh, a bottle or closing drinks um, downstairs. And before I start, um, I would like to thank the Research Center for Material Cultures, the Museum of World Cultures, where we are now, uh, in particular, Annette van Dijk and uh, Michael Lenoir, who are helping us out today. And I want to thank the different departments of cultural anthropology and the Meertens Institute for supporting the ABV and thereby also supporting this day. So now it is my pleasure to introduce the first two speakers of today, um, which is uh, Bram Buscher, uh, who is Chair of Development Sociology at Wageningen University. Um, he researches the relations between nature, development and political economy. And he published, together with Robert Fletcher, a book called The Conservation Revolutions, Radical Ideas for Saving Nature Beyond the Anthropocene. Quite a mouthful. And even more recently, the book, The Truth About Nature, Environmentalism in the Era of Post-Truth Politics and Platform Capitalism. And we will probably hear more about this today. Huh? And Bram's ta talk will be followed by Rebecca Ibanez-Martin, 
who will act as a discussant and, uh, and thereby sort of open up our, our discussions and conversations of the day. And Rebecca is an anthropologist at the Meertens Institute, where she leads the thematic area Food, Body and Well-Being. And she also researches animal and human relations in animal farms in the Netherlands. So welcome to Bram and to Rebecca and a welcome to you all. Uh, we as the ABV, we really hope you will enjoy this day and we wish you yeah, lots of fun. <laughs> Bram, the, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, uh, Nikki. And thanks to you and, and to Marcus and Elizabeth uh, for the absolute honor to, to be able to speak here today. And to all of you uh, for, for coming and listening. Um, and I must say, uh, you know, I, I, I do do presentations more regularly, but this one, I, I was a little bit nervous, right? Like speaking, I'm not an anthropologist by training. So standing in front of a, a big group full of anthropologists skilled in the art of deconstruction and then trying to uphold some idea of truth, you know, it's, it's slightly intimidating, but nonetheless, I'm, I'm incredibly pleased to, to be here. And um, let me see if I can put my PowerPoint up. Where's the mouse? There we go. All right, great. We are ready. So what does it mean to do ethnography in the post-truth era and what are the stakes involved for the idea of truth? So my keynote addresses uh, this and explores this question. And it does not have many answers, let alone any clear-cut ones, but it's meant to join many others, including, I think, all of you here, in a search for answers and way forward. So my own road uh, towards finding an answer to this question started about 10 years ago, without me actually really knowing it. It started when I was... Um, uh, uh, I started a project on the digitalization of nature conservation, and it provisionally culminated in a book last year that, that Nikki mentioned called The Truth About Nature. A very arrogant title, I know. <laughs> um, and I emphasize provisionally culminated in this book because while I believe the book you know, has, um, is part of the answer, at least a major inspiration for this lecture, it still leaves many issues uh, unanswered, including the question of ethnography in a continuously changing world. So I'm therefore profoundly grateful actually for this opportunity to continue the journey that started over a decade. <laughs> So like I said, back then, I started the project on how emerging digital online media were changing the politics and practices of nature conservation. And at first, this was a rather standard multi-level ethnographic project with a digital component as one of the levels. But after doing this project for about three years, and the funding had by then sort of uh, stopped already, um, going from online conservation uh, sites to uh, Southern Africa and, and back again, I actually realized I was, I was missing a lot. Um, I had produced a couple of uh, papers, etc. But around that time, this was 2015 when I was uh, finishing the project, I felt that my sort of standard multi-level ethnography with this digital component, um, following relations, issues, things, power, people, and more, was also quite limited. And two dynamics actually clarified this for me. And I'm sure all of you remember the time around 2015-16. Um, but the first was a consolidation, uh, just two dynamics. The first was a consolidation and the rapid growth of these online platforms. They've been in existence, of course, but they were building big, you know, interactive online structures that have since completely reshoveled the global economy, but also academia and much of our daily lives. So I see online platforms, just to be sure, as online intersections, right? They aim to be between all of us and everything that we want to do in life. 
So if you want to go somewhere, Google Maps. If you want to see how cool you are as a scholar, right? Google Scholar. If you want to check in with your friends, Facebook. But you have to traverse these platforms uh, online and so forth. And this is a very powerful in-between position that has become very central to the new surveillance or platform capitalist economy that many of us willingly or perhaps unwillingly submit much of our lives and work to. The second dynamic around the same time was the rise of post-truth, right? As a core component of the election of Trump and the Brexit campaign. And these extraordinary events, you know, certainly had something to do with this new platform economy, but I, I myself didn't quite know exactly what. But what was clear to me at the time was that post-truth was profoundly troubling for the actors that I was studying, right? Conservationists who firmly believe that our environmental crisis is probably you know, the most important and dangerous truth of our day and age. Now, this was a conundrum, if ever there was one. Right? Just when environmental scientists and conservationists thought they were making some serious headway convincing the world that the climate crisis and biodiversity crisis are real, the problem of post-truth enters the stage. And then, so in response, what they did was they ramped up their politics, making use of these new digital platforms to spread the truth about nature. So this was interesting for me, uh, but also highly problematic. After all, as a social scientist, you know, I was also trained in the art of deconstruction, and the idea of truth seemed highly suspicious to me. But at the same time, I also had to admit that this post-truth thing you know, was equally troubling to me, and that I do still believe that there is also a deep and dangerous truth to our environmental crisis. And so I started a new journey. <clears throat> searching a way out of this conundrum, which also meant I had to confront the question of truth head on. And so I did. Uh, it ultimately, uh, culminated ultimately in a political ecology of truth that explores an epistemological positioning for combining ethnographic knowledge on the one hand and political economy on the other hand. But while I believe this outlook on truth is important, for this lecture actually it's less important than its anthropological implications. How can anthropologists position themselves in a crisis of truth? as the um, statement for this anthropology day states. And again, there are many ways to answer this question, but here I will focus particularly on ethnography as an anthropological method and epistemological practice of research, uh, thinking and writing. And my tentative argument here is that if anthropologists wish to re-explore and perhaps even reclaim truth, which I believe they should, right, for the same reasons I started searching for it, namely on the one hand, the emergence of post-truth and, and the truth of our socio-ecological predicaments, they will have to recalibrate the global multi-level ethnography that many of us have embraced over the last decades with an exploration of what I'm tentatively calling a planetary ethnography that focuses more centrally on power. The difference between the two is also the difference between friction and tension that was in the, in the abstract. So hence, when I say the frictions and tensions of reorienting ethnography in the post-truth era, I basically mean two things. That reorienting, or, or perhaps better, further developing um, ethnography is necessary, but difficult, right? It comes with frictions and tensions. But also that frictions and tensions are different, are dissimilar, and allow for different types of ethnographic knowledge and epistemological positioning, whereby the latter also perhaps allows for a reorientation towards truth. So this then is what I want to discuss in the next half hour or so. First, to explore and illustrate friction as an, as an ethnographic practice, which I will do by rereading my own book backwards, <laughs> starting with some of the case studies in part three of the book, and then reflect a bit on my ethnographic practice as I uh, 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 move to part two, which explores the question of truth in relation to uh, political economy and uh, power and platform uh, issues. Handouts of the talk? Yes. I can make it available, yeah? Okay. Yeah? How much are my down now? I have it here, so I can, I can, I can certainly make, uh, although there are some, some parts that are not written now, so, <laughs> so I can definitely make it available. So yeah, maybe otherwise if there might be, I understand. <laughs> um, so this exploration about truth and political economy ultimately leads me to this you know, political ecology of truth that I find helpful in understanding and challenging post-truth. 
And then finally, it takes elements you know, of part one of the book, uh, which is about theoretical, uh, meta-theoretical and philosophical reflections, to present some musings and questions about reorienting ethnography that hopefully helps the discussion afterwards. So here I will also explicate, explicate the difference between friction and tension and or how to combine an ethnography of um, global connections in Anat Singh's words with a planetary ethnography. So two caveats before I move on. And the first is a confession. I'm not an anthropologist by training. I'm actually a political scientist. Uh, and while I did my PhD in the you know, inspiring anthropology department of, of, of the university, I, I really cannot claim that I'm an anthropologist. Uh, it, as I said, I, was, uh, I started as a political scientist. My PhD was with an anthropologist, a political scientist, and a geographer as, um, as supervisors. Uh, then I moved into a development studies institute. Now I'm a professor of sociology, and my field is actually political ecology. <laughs> so you, you, make, you make of that what you want, but I don't even know what I am, so I'm not even going to try to, uh, try to uh, address that. But I have followed anthropological discussions you know, since, uh, since my PhD with a lot of interest. But if certain things may sound naive or silly to you, then, then my apologies. Second, a warning, uh, crisis of truth. <laughs> it's not the most easygoing of themes, obviously, <laughs> right? So if you know, some of these things may be a little bit abstract or theoretical, um, then uh, I hope you'll bear with me, but I will attempt uh, to flavor my, uh, my story with some illustrations from my research to clarify, uh, clarify the points that I want to make. All right, starting with part three of the book. And that thing makes a convincing case for ethnographic attention to friction in a globalized world, for understanding, mobilizing universals that seek influence and power. And she understands universals as ambitions or political projects like development, human rights, freedom, and argues that universals are effective within particular historical conjunctures that give them content and force. We might specify this conjunctural feature of universals in practice by speaking of engagement. Engaged universals travel across difference and are charged and changed by their travels. Through friction, universals become practically effective. Yet they can never fulfill the promises of universality. Even in transcending localities, they cannot take over the world. In other words, friction for Tsing is an effective ethnographic practice. Right? She argues that, quote, No, there we go. Attention to frictions, to friction opens the possibility of an ethnographic account of global <coughs> interconnection. Abstract claims about the globe can be studied as they operate in the world. And it leads to what she calls sticky engagements that should be the center of our ethnographic attention. So I've been much inspired by Tsing's ideas about friction, very much so. And this is what I think much of the part three of my book actually does. It shows how conservation actors employ digital media to promote the universal ambitions of saving nature in biodiverse parts of the world, often originating from the global north and focused on the global south. So in my case, from the Netherlands and Europe, focusing on southern Africa. So let me give some examples of these type of frictions from my research and how they lead to sticky engagements and meshed with race, gender, class, and other conditionalities of power. So here you see the PIF World platform. This is still a, a, a site in the Netherlands that engages people that want to uh, do good uh, and feel good about it, as, the, as their earlier slogan uh, shows. Um, and um, believe it or not, but I don't know whether you can read that. Here it says in the corner, play with the planet. So if you used to click on that, the planet would actually come forward. And they, I, I'm, I'm not kidding, they would literally state that in your lunch break, you can save a child slave in India, rescue an elephant in Southern Africa, you know, like help uh, uh, small scale miners in Latin America, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all in your lunch break, and then you, you know, con continue with, your, with the rest of your life. PIF stands for play it forward. So the idea is that, you know, if you get on board, right, and you get three of your, your friends and buddies, you know, soon the whole world will be on board and we can do all these you know, great things. So one of the main projects that they had in the beginning was this project called the Elephant Corridor. And here I'll show, it's probably a little bit too small maybe to see it, that's why I enlarged the map and the idea. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of the map uh, put on there by a conservation organization 
um, was to get elephants from the Chobi National Park in Botswana, uh, in the south there, to the Kafuba Flats in Zambia. And they, so, so, you know, here, when I go back, even if you can't read it, but the idea was that you can, you can, you know, get your friends on board and you can chat with them and, you know, you can uh, encourage each other to save, to save the elephants. And according to some, you know, help 100,000 elephants run to freedom. I mean, literally a quote from the, from the site. Yeah, you can imagine, perhaps, that when you live in between those two parks and you have a field, that 100,000 elephants running to freedom is not great, right? Um, you know, elephants are big and pretty destructive uh, for those who, who may not know that. But, uh, but um, so, 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 you know, I immediately thought, you know, this, this may not be a great idea or not the best idea in the world. But the online um, excitement was incredible, right? Everybody was all over this, right? Congratulating each other, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so basically, what I did is, uh, you know, I went to uh, Southern Africa and checked out what was happening on the ground, right? How people actually related to this, you know, uh, in Botswana, Namibia, and, and Zambia. And I just want to give you one quote from an interview that I, this is literally the first interview that I did. Um, with uh, the director of uh, a conservation organization called Elephants Without Borders, uh, <laughs> figuring that that would be a good place to start. And so I asked her about this corridor, and she answered, yes, someone at the Department of Wildlife two years ago asked me whether this was our thing. And they were furious that someone else was fundraising for this, and they didn't know about any of it. Nobody had contacted them, so they inquired with us, and then I checked it out, and I was floored, because it doesn't exist. It didn't exist. So I was absolutely appalled. So I mentioned this to the Kivango Sambezi, the, the area uh, that wants to create this transboundary conservation area, their office several times, but then they say the Peace Parks Foundation wants it, a big conservation organization. But I feel money needs to go where it's needed most, and hence they need to be advised where they can best put their money, not in this type of elephant corridor. Now, th this was the first interview that I had. Literally, the woman was, at first, <laughs> the lady actually thought, that I was involved in this because I came from the Netherlands. And she basically shouted at me for, for about 40 minutes before I could actually get a question in to say, no, I have not, don't worry, I'm a critical anthropologist, or <laughs> pretend to be at least. Um, and I have nothing to do with that corridor, absolutely nothing. So please don't attack you know, me. I'm, I'm actually trying to find out what the heck is going on here. Um, but clearly you can see you know, there were lots of frictions, right? Immediately, just by putting up that map online, it led to all these frictions with the Botswana government between actors on the ground. And from there, I spent, you know, uh, several trips in the region, actually, you know, uh, denoting further, further of these frictions. But the funny thing was, in the end, for the platform in the Netherlands, that was quite irrelevant, right? The whole idea was that this would be a big attention, you know, uh, thing would attract a lot of people. And it actually, it did, right? It did attract uh, a lot of people online. And for, for them, that was great. That they just wanted to be the platform for all kinds of do-good projects. So what actually happens on the ground? Yeah, well, whatever. Here's a second example from my research. So I, at the time I was doing my research, there was a major rhino poaching crisis. Uh, as you can see, a lot of these kind of pictures were shared, you know, like, um, their horns hacked off their face. I mean, absolutely appalling in and of itself, obviously. Um, but around that was a huge politics, particularly in South Africa. Now, for those who, who know South Africa and the, and the racial politics there, um, conservation, in short, is basically a very white thing still. It's changing, uh, certainly, but very much still a, a white thing. And the place that was targeted the most, the Kruger National Park, um, is, is kind of a refuge to many white people. They often feel that they, um, you know, they, they can then be themselves and do their bribes and, and complain about, you know, the, the government and, and all that. Uh, so when these rhinos were being attacked, you know, it, was, it felt like an attack on white identity itself, mm. right? And that was sort of messed up, meshed up with all these online uh, discourses. So again, don't even try to read it because it's too small, but what it says here in this Facebook um, uh, news item, it says two, two suspected poachers, I should say, 
killed in a Kruger shootout. Barely three hours later, there are literally hundreds of comments celebrating this, like in Afrikaans and English, etc. Yes, great, kill them all, get rid of them. You know, this is this is a good start. Uh, can I provide ammo, etc., 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 etc. So basically, what that what that what that did is legitimating and celebrating violence and the death of poachers, bringing poachers down to what our government would call bare life. So that, you know, if they're not no longer covered by rights, if they, according to these online discourses, put themselves out of rights, right, then shooting them is no longer seen as a, as a crime, right? So how I actually analyzed this was also as a particular form of, you know, friction as a politics of racialized hysteria, right? And hysteria, just just to be absolutely sure, it's not, not, not in any way related to the gender IDs in relation to hysteria, but more in relation to when emotions you know, go completely out of control and when people try frantically to, to reclaim those kind of emotions, either through violence or you know, heroism or, or, or other things. And so here, it's about the strategic use of situations in which emotions run high for particular, in this case, white interests, right? So that they could more legitimately, you know, according to themselves, <laughs> of course not according to others, but criticize the state, curse black people, condone violence, right, through spaces of exception, create all kinds of heroic identities for themselves, right, walking for rhinos, etc., etc., etc. So all this, you know, also, you know, from an ID of conservation, from this sort of universal ID of trying to um, uh, save nature, Right? And, and, and do good about it, uh, and, and, and leading to all these kind of frictions. So all these, I believe, are sticky engagements that lead to ethnographic insights into the relation between universals like conservation and the lives and spaces they aim to change and intervene in. But while I like the term sticky engagements actually very much, Tsing had a very specific reasons to foreground this term. So if we extend the quote where she introduces the term, she actually makes explicit how and why we should refer to these things as frictions. Quote, we might thus ask about universals, not as truths or lies, but as sticky engagements. So I think this is an elegant and a very productive way to circumvent any sticky discussion on truth and rather focus on what universals do as sticky engagements. And Singh is correct. Right? Especially since the potential for friction is now greater than it has arguably ever been. And there is thus a very rich ethnographic field for studying global connections in the way that she proposes. It studies the power of universals that enable forms of capitalist development, freedom, etc., human rights, and more. And it can also yield important anthropological insights into how different communities and actors actually relate to these universals, right? appropriate them, transform them, as they are confronted with them. And I think a lot of the research of, of colleagues in, in, in our department in Wageningen, including Elizabeth Research and others, actually really engage, engage with, with, with universals also in this way. So I, I think this is incredibly productive. So there's, there's, there's no critique of that uh, in any way, but it does of course leave open the question, right? If so, and how to evaluate these engagements. Now, this is something that Anna Marie Moll also points at in her famous book, The Body Multiple. There, she makes the case that there is no representational reality out there to ground us, no truth. But she argues we may still seek positive interventions. Quote, instead of truth, goodness comes to the center of the stage. So obviously, this leads to further questions about what good entails which he does not really answer, other than emphasizing that goodnesses are multiple, like ontologies. But of course, the point is that Tsing and Mol very deliberately bracket the question of truth in favor of sticky engagements, multiple ontologies, and other frictions. Right? A frictions foreground encounters and allow for emphasizing difference, diversity, multiplicity, etc. Now, this, of course, has been you know, one of anthropology's driving forces of late, including in relation to the celebration of the friction of different ontological worlds. So in important ways, we could argue that Tsing and Moll's research allow us to get closer to a more truthful account of global connections and frictions as they play out in the world. 
But at the same time, this is deliberately done by sidelining the concept and the idea of truth. But what if this is no longer good enough for anthropology? Right? What if we need to highlight truth in our planetary socio-ecological predicaments? And what if we are bothered by post-truth? Do we then again need to reconsider the worlds of anthropology by more deliberately engaging with the concept and idea of truth? No surprise, I argue that we should, right? Not just because of the troubling issues with post-truth in our global predicaments, but also because it leads to different ethnographic questions, answers, and insights. And this was a struggle I was faced with around 2015 and 16, after I had written and published three of the four empirical uh, friction chapters in part three of the book. Like I said, up to this point, I had more or less followed the classical ethnographic division that we all know. Described by P.J. Fossin as follows. Ethnograph ethnography can be said to have two lives. The first life consists of field work. And this is very, very standard, right? Like, it's defining characters participant observation during long periods of time, being there, living among, and a second life entails writing. It corresponds to the analysis of the empirical material and its elaboration into a theoretical framework that gives birth to a document, a book, an article, or a film. So I had produced some documents, and while I was sort of happy with them, like I said before, I strongly felt that the bigger picture actually eluded me. So all this was reinforced by the events happening around this time, the emergence of post-truth due to Trump and Brexit, and worsening socio-ecological crisis. And when those same conservationists, whose universals I had been deconstructing, started to strongly push back against post-truth, to uphold the truth about nature as they saw it, I was in doubt. I did not disagree with their unease, but also did not dare to talk about truth, right? Instead, I started what increasingly felt like a next ethnographic <laughs> journey, whose contours at the point at, at that time I did not actually myself really understand. And that led to part two of my book. Some have commented when they read the books on part two as theory. Right, they, they, that, that is particular. But for me, it was much more than that. And the following quote by uh, João de Pina Cabral, who writes a lot about worlds, helps to clarify. The writing of the ethnography consists of proposing an abstraction of the way people's worlds is shaped. Uh, people's world is shaped. It aims to inform about the way human action has reified itself into specific into a specific local world in the form of houses, objects roots, languages, texts, gestures, rituals, and so on, end quote. Now, to a good degree, this is correct and still gives direction, I think, to much ethnographic work. But there are, of course, two problems. The first is that the world of global connections we currently live in is not adequately captured or emphasized. And this is the question of friction, where certain ideas, ambitions, actors, or programs with universal ambitions clash with lived daily lives on all levels of scale, space, and time. So friction here helps us again to understand ethnographically how the clashing of different worlds or realities reifies itself into objects, gestures, rituals, and so on. But the second issue goes a step further. What if certain universals, but also other local particularities, constantly enter the life worlds of communities and of ourselves, right? As in nearly all the time. What if it's increasingly harder to separate some universals from life worlds, and we start to hybridize more and more. Now, this is, of course, the case in our digital world, even though this itself is still highly uneven across time, space, and different actors. But the key difference here is that these universals are not ambitions like development, freedom, or human rights, but a mode of power based on highly universal forms of technology, surveillance, and influence. So the ethnographic implications of the digital have, of course, you know, been debated extensively by anthropologists, including, I think, many here. Though many, you know, have still opted, like I did in the beginning, to regard the digital realm as another encounter element that shapes communities and life worlds, but perhaps now online. So a prominent early example of this is the, uh, the book by Tom Bulstorff, Coming of Age in Second Life. An anthropologist explores the, uh, explores the virtually human which emphasizes, literally, that it focuses strictly on the worlds of participants as they play out online. But if indeed the online has become such an innate part of our daily <coughs> life, and for most of the lives of the communities we study, you know, to such a degree that new media scholars keep repeating ad nauseum 
that any distinction between the online and the offline is no longer relevant, right? Should we not have a better and deeper understanding of what this online is? If it is a constant part of our life, lives, if it constantly tries to direct our lives, and if it is a near constant distraction in our lives, then how does it shape our worlds and that of the communities we study? And again, this has become an ethnographic question that many have already tackled, right? And that many are already, um, that many have been working on over the last decades. And this for me led to the part two of my book. And that's why I not, don't really refer to that as theory, but an ethnography of online platforms, post-truth uh, politics and new forms of capitalist power. So the key question for me at the start of part two of the book is, what happens when environmentalists turn to digital media to promote the truth about nature? And what happens if we follow the clicks online? This became an ethnographic search in and of itself that led me into platforms, algorithms, lots of crazy new acronyms, Google, Facebook, now blockchain, which I think is bullshit anyway, but, <laughs> and ultimately the way the new online no, really, I mean, seriously, <laughs> this, this, this hype, you know, these hypes are, you know, come faster and faster and faster. Blockchain is just a ledger, you know, you put crap in, crap comes out. That's basically <laughs> all I have to say about that. Um, but the key here is, you know, the way the new online economy is structured and evolving. So I quickly came to realize that this online world was rapidly building and projecting a familiar but also a distinctly new form of capitalist power onto the world. And I struggled to understand this world and this power. But you know, when terms like platform capitalism and others started emerging around 2017, it became a bit clearer to me. And so I want to just um, you know, give you a bit of an idea of what I understand with platform capitalism and how for me it relates to post-truth. So platform capitalism, very briefly, is in its most simplistic form, the current organizational change of global capitalism to make use of the abundance of data. And uh, Nick Cernisek uh, actually distinguishes data, which he um, uh, defines as information that something happened from knowledge, information about why something happened. And obviously the more data platforms can access and record, the more they can link the patterns and hence try to predict our behaviors, preferences and likes, which obviously they do through algorithms. Now, for, I think most of us know these days, but just to give you, you know, some background on how I understand algorithms simply as procedural and calculative decision mechanisms or sets of rules that sort data and process these according to particular modes of reasoning. And in this, this way, they estimate knowledge. But ultimately, this is a knowledge based on data, on data they can gather, right? Combined with, for us, unknown algorithmic rationalities. And it becomes a knowledge focused on correlation between keywords, hyperlinks, and other data that we all leave behind all of the time. So what emerges from that in the platform capitalist world is a model where effective intensity comes to stand in for and displace referential truth, authenticity, and factual evidence. And what uh, 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 the author, at least Andreevich, means with that is that increasingly what we focus on and what we understand is increasingly um, uh, influenced by trends, by what is trending, right? Hashtags and, and, and these kind of things, by fads, right? Because these become big things that get all the attention, then get, you know, often taken up by, by mainstream media even. And in that sense, um, you know, intensity of knowledge, intensity of the circulation of knowledge increasingly relates to knowledge uh, more broadly. Another thing that happens is that it submits the veracity of knowledge to market legit legitimacy in the sense that if you throw something online, and you get followers or likes or shares, you know, you might believe that this is actually, you know, worthy knowledge, right? And obviously here you can, I think, start to see exactly the problem, right? Many people that do get a lot of followers, a lot of likes, a lot of shares, find, you know, like their knowledge legitimate. Like there's a market for it, right? People buy into it, literally. Now, you know, if you know this, you can start to use that, right? You can start to 
abuse that, mm. right? So in that sense, Trump is not a total idiot. Of course he is. <laughs> but he, he and many others actually understand this intuitively and make use of this. Mm. So in that sense, Annette Rouvois actually refers to algorithmic knowledge as knowledge without truth. It doesn't challenge things anymore. It doesn't put things in context, right? Anything and everything goes. So if I bring that back to the question of conservation, for example, the question of why I am interested to save nature becomes irrelevant compared to the information that I want to save nature for platforms, right? The truth, objective fact, according to algorithms, is the latter, right? Whereby likes and shares and followers, etc., on platforms are expressions of equivalence, right? The equivalent between you and that which you've clicked on or, or which you have liked, right? Interpreted as expressions or of affection or support. And of course, this, this led to a big problem for Facebook at some point, right? Because it, at first they only had the, the like thing, but if people shared sad news, right? An equivalent between you and that person was made based on shared news, it was a bit awkward to, to give a thumbs up to that, right? And now you have all kinds of other expressions. You know, as long as you click on it, Facebook is happy. Right? So my argument here is that sharing the truth about nature online, ironically, right, stimulates the very forces that undermine the truth about nature by promoting post-truth. So for me, post-truth, and this of course is where I get to the first sort of statement of my political ecology of truth, is not something that individuals do and or say. Post-truth is an expression of power under platform capitalism not some updated variant of lies or bullshit. So very briefly, if a liar knows the truth and doesn't want somebody else to know the truth, right? I killed someone, someone, and uh, I don't want you to know it, so I, I say I don't, I didn't, right? That's, that's a pretty typical lie on every movie. A bullshitter doesn't care about lying or truth, uh, you know, just maybe wants attention. Anything goes, etc. But post-truth, for me, I take it literal, beyond truth, post. It doesn't matter anymore at all, right? Whether it's truths or lies shared online, platforms don't care, right? As long as everybody stays online for as long as possible, leaving behind data that can be used and sold. And so for me, post-truth is not something that is ages old, but is really tied to the functionality of platforms. The thing is that increasingly many other actors understand this, right? And actively make use of this, right? Fighting truth wars on Twitter and on Facebook and, and what have you, uh, which is, you know, generally uh, really destructive, right? Thus, you know, rendering post-truth an expression of power. So this then is where I argue post-truth comes from, right? a very specific idea of post-truth. And it actually leads to many of the questions asked in relation to this Anthropology Day. How to respond to post-truth, how to position ourselves, how to study power, etc. And to reflect on this, I propose a political ecology of truth in my book. Political ecology, because it links ecology and politics, you know, the natural and social sciences. I have to because I'm at Wageningen University. Uh, and hence, different types of knowledge and knowing but gives each a particular place and sees them as intrins intrinsically connected. Of truth, because it takes Foucault seriously, in that truth is always power, and that through studying power, we can better understand truth and truths as they manifest in the world. So it means we take ecology and the truth of the ecological crisis seriously, while also at the same time seeing these as mediated by people, culture, interests, race, gender, and so forth. It also has a strong focus on the political, and hence the role of knowledge and understanding in society, which brings us back, I think, to ethnography. But let's take this step by step. First, what is this political ecology of truth? And next, what possible implications for ethnography can we derive from this? So the first statement you know, of a political ecology of truth, as I mentioned already, is that post-truth is an expression of power under platform capitalism, not some updated variant of lies or bullshit. So what matters here is that if we want to search for truth, we have to study power. 
And I understand and completely accept that not all anthropological research should or needs to study power. In fact, I think that would even impoverish anthropological research. But given that post-truth directly challenges and disempowers any form of knowledge, whether truer or not, and if I'm right that post-truth itself is an expression of power, then any attempt to position ourselves vis-a-vis post-truth would mean that we need to study this form of power. And hence why I argue that this specific conceptualization of post-truth and how it is distinct from lies and bullshit prods a deeper understanding of changing forms of capitalist power. In other words, it is the specific form of platform capitalist power that's currently dominant, that enables, even thrives on post-truth. In one way, And in one way or another, I believe anthropology needs to position itself in relation to this form of power. But I'll, I'll come back to that. At the same time, if post-truth bothers us, and if post-truth is an expression of power, then a clear case for re-emphasizing the importance of truth is made. And truth is important, because if nothing truthful can be said about power, how could we ever hope to understand, let alone confront it? And again, as we know from Foucault, truth and power are always connected. One of his most famous statements is the following. The important thing here is that truth isn't outside power or lacking in power. Truth is a thing of this world. It is produced only by virtue of multiple forms of constraint and it induces regular effects of power. Each society has its own regime of truth, its general politics of truth. That is, the types of discourses which it accepts and makes function as true. The mechanisms and instances uh, which enable one to distinguish true and false statements, the means by which each is sanctioned, the techniques and procedures accorded value in the acquisition of truth, and the status of those who are charged with saying what counts as true. So this quote is fascinating in many respects, but also, of course, especially in relation to the power of new media uh, sanctioned. For example, here, um, you know, the mechanisms and instances which enable one to distinguish true and false statements of what is increasingly less, less obvious with, with platforms. Uh, but Foucault, importantly, did not only emphasize that truth and power are always interconnected, he also emphasized the politically liberating potential of this insight. So later in, the, in a book called The Courage uh, of Truth, he stated, quote, it's not a matter of emancipating truth from every system of power, which would be chimera, for truth is always and already power, <coughs> but of detaching the power of truth from the forms of hegemony, social, economic, and cultural, within which it operates at the present time. So it's not a matter of emancipating truth from every system of power, that's impossible, but of detaching the power of truth from the forms of hegemony, social, economic, and cultural, within which it operates at the present time. And this phrasing, I think, is interesting. It suggests that while truth is power, it is at the same time more than that, with, which gives it power. Right. Precisely what Foucault means with this might be gleaned from what he stated shortly before his death in 1984. In his last lecture series, tellingly entitled The Courage of Truth, as I mentioned, Foucault, according to Frédéric Gross, emphasized truth as, quote, that which makes a difference in the world and in people's opinions, that which forces one to transform one's mode of being, that whose difference opens up to the perspective of another world to be constructed, to be imagined. Again, let me just rephrase that because I think it's, it's really important. Right? Truth as that which makes a difference in the world and in people's opinions. That which forces one to transform one's mode of being. That whose difference opens up to the perspective of another world to be constructed, to imagine. And I take this prompt of Foucault seriously. If we wish to realistically understand and confront the environmental and other crises in the area of post-truth, then the courage of truth in the sense of speaking truth to power, is precisely what is at stake, both in theory and in practice. But it's really hard to promote the art of speaking truth to power if truth can only ever be uttered in brackets, as something that exists solely to be deconstructed rather than also constructed or sought after, as something that only leads to competitive, uh, discursive and destructive truth wars, and not also to common understanding. 
So speaking truth to power can render truth productive by saying something accurate about power such that one can see beyond it, such that, quote, the perspective of another world to be constructed, to be imagined, opens up. And hence the second statement, truth is not just power, but also more than power. And hence why I believe this statement makes transformation possible. But in order to speak truth to power, we need to more consciously and deliberately think through the relations between knowledge, understanding, and data. And that leads me to the third and final statement. The relations between data, knowledge, and understanding are increasingly confused and corrupted. So let me explain this and then move on to its potential implications for ethnography and conclude. Data, as mentioned, is information that something happened, which uh, Nick Cernisek distinguishes from knowledge information, but why something happened. Both, in turn, and based on Hannah Arendt's work, are different from understanding, which makes knowledge meaningful. So that, for me, is the difference between knowledge and understanding. It makes knowledge meaningful. Now, platform capitalism incessantly colonizes our life worlds to capture as much data on and about us as possible. They do this to build knowledge about us that they can sell to advertisers. And hence, one of their core motivations is to keep us online for as long as possible, as much as possible, consciously or unconsciously, through tracking devices in our phones, etc. Now, for Mark Zuckerberg, the main meaning in life literally comes from connections, according to a very recent interview, which, of course, incidentally, is exactly what his company focuses on facilitating online. But since this is commodified connection, it also hollows out meaning by instrumentalizing and pushing it for commercial gain. And in the process, two critical things happen. Two critical things that worry many digital media scholars like Shoshana Zuboff, William Chul Han, Siva, uh, Fayadanathan, and many others. It allows us to delve deeper and deeper, on the one hand, it allows us to delve deeper and deeper into our own individualized realities, thereby actually creating more division and separation in societies, while, secondly, rendering increasingly totalized surveillance and monitoring the norm rather than the exceptions. So here is where Hannah Arendt's work uh, words are critical when she argues that, quote, without reality shared with other human beings, truth loses all meaning. This is because for her, truth is on the same level as understanding, a process of transcending knowledge such that it provides meaning. And this meaning in turn, I think, comes from three main things, context, history, and positionality. So in my words, taking into account context, history, and positionality, in order to transcend these into something common is the hallmark of truth. So this conceptualization of truth immediately shows why platform capitalism is so important in understanding post-truth. Because the search for understanding of context, history, and positionality cannot be transcended into something common online. First of all, because snippets of people's lives, positionality, context, and histories are increasingly muddled together on timelines, exactly as Nikki just said on her Facebook timeline, right? By algorithms who, that literally do not care whether something is accurate or not, meaningful or not, or truthful or not. This is why Antoinette Rouffard refers to algorithmic knowledge as knowledge without truth. Second, because the legitimacy of knowledge increasingly derives from market dynamics, as I mentioned. These days, many people, including many academics, look for what generates likes, shares, and followers, or in our case, citations, right? So the swift circulation of discourse that sells, knowledge that generates likes and followers, becomes more important under platform capitalism than any idea of truth. And when something generates a lot of likes or followers, it's often assumed to have some relevance or value. Again, therefore, the relations between data, knowledge, and understanding are increasingly confused and corrupted, whereby the focus has shifted from understanding and even from knowledge to data, the very kernel upon which commercial platform epistemology has been built. So the Korean philosopher Buyung Chul Han refers to this as dataism, which according to him is, quote, the result of a renunciation of meaning and context in many people's lives. It's meant to fill the vacuum of meaning. 
But at the same time, he and others warn of the growing digital panopticon that the majority of world citizens are now under to a greater or lesser degree. Quote, as a new form of production, digital communication seeks to dismantle protected spaces and transform everything into information and data. And literally, Shoshana Zuboff actually says that anything that doesn't want to be, you know, anything that you don't want to be given up as data are becoming sort of uh, black holes of data that need to be opened up in order to help platform capitalists make the world you know, better for you. Through this process, all protective distance is lost. In the context of hyper-communication, everything is mixed up with everything else. The borders between inside and outside become more and more permeable, and humans become interfaces with a totally interconnected world. Hyper-capitalism furthers, further, uh, furthers and exploits this digital defenselessness. Hence why, I even, uh, hence why I even hold that the relations between data and knowledge uh, and understanding are deliberately corrupted by post-truth and platform capitalism. And this corruption is at the basis of a form of totalitarian power that exceeds the universals Tsing talk, uh, talks about. It literally wants to turn everything and everyone in the world into data. And mind you, also in academia, right? Elsevier is very far ahead. If any of you have a uh, research dot fill in your university dot nl website you're just a you know little data point for elsevier that is connected with pure their um, their uh, university administration system with fingerprint how that works into uh, digital media and with lots of other systems that are currently being rolled out to an incredible degree so it doesn't matter whether you're critical as an anthropologist on that you are just as you know, susceptible to that in terms of your writing as everybody else. And that is freaking scary. <laughs> so hence why we urgently need, need to reassess the relations between data, knowledge, and understanding in order to speak truth to power. The question, of course, is how? And what is the role for ethnography in this? I'm getting towards the end. There are many possible answers to this. right? And as I said at the beginning, I certainly don't have all of them, if any at all. But what I do believe is critical, as mentioned before, <laughs> is that anthropology needs to position itself in relation to these new forms of totalitarian power. So by one core and perhaps a little bit daring suggestion here, is that ethnography should find a new or different balance between frictions, things that chafe the sticky engagements of externals, even worlds, and tensions, things that stretch, that comprise internal strain, even infarction. The latter, while potentially even more violent than frictions, may reorient ethnography towards the question of truth. It inverts Tsing's argument that, quote, we might just ask about universals, not as truths or lies, but as sticky engagements into, we might ask about universalizing even totalitarian power, not as sticky engagements, but as a point of tension to search for and speak truth. And I can explain this by conceptualizing tensions, both negatively and positively. Negatively, tension means moving away from a conceptualization of power as something external, as encounter, something that travels and affects others who then respond, resulting in friction, to a conception of post-truth platform power that feeds much more on positive internal intensification, resulting in tensions. So the violence of friction is about clashes or external pressures, and so, and so forth. The violence of tension is burnout, caused by internal stretch and strain. <coughs> so Buyung Chul Han refers to this as the violence of positivity, which, quote, doesn't deprive, it saturates, it doesn't execute, it exhausts. It expresses itself not as repression, but as depression, end quote. And this is precisely what platform media drastically intensify. They allow people to positively expose themselves online, thereby saturating them by the very need for positivity through likes, shares, citations, followers, etc. This in turn, I believe, corresponds to the planetary discussions that are going on through the positive feedback <coughs> loop loops in our Earth system, now triggered by climate change. Right? Our environmental crisis is increasingly becoming a self-fulfilling positive feedback loop leading to a burned out planet. The question is how to study this ethnographically. And I believe two paths that anthropology has already been taking and this for me was, was, was a really interesting part of the search when I was preparing for, the, for this lecture. Right? These discussions 
are very, are very old, but I think two in particular reassert themselves with urgency here. The first is the connection between dialectics and ethnography, including the link with philosophy. The second is the connection between ethnography and political economy. Again, there's nothing new here. These, these have been going on for a long time, but I think they reassert themselves with urgency. Because, you know, dialectics, because it focuses on internalized relations, not external or externalized relations, both in relation to individuals and indeed the entire planet, giving a new idea about the universal. So this would translate into a potential planetary ethnography that accepts, <coughs> accepts a universal planetary as consisting of internal relations that cause increasingly violent tensions that burn out rather than universals as external pressures leading to violent frictions. At the same time, it may lead to a renewal between anthropology and, I can't believe I'm actually saying this, but psychoanalysis. <laughs> because one of my uh, close colleagues, uh, Rob Fletcher, has been talking about this for ages, as, as Elizabeth also knows. And, you know, like if people like Zizek, which scared the shit out of me, go on this, on this train, I, I, I for a long time didn't want to accept uh, that, that this was quite relevant, but actually, right, a psychoanalytic ethnography that takes internal psychic strains placed on people in the planet more seriously, I actually think is critical. Because both of these switch from encounters between things to forms of strain, strains within things. Now, as I said, these are connections that have already been made, but could use, use more development in the years ahead. What they will allow is a closer examination of the types of power increasingly prevalent in this day and age, and so enable speaking truth to the specific forms of power that render knowledge increasingly meaningless and cause post-truth. And this leads me to the positive connotation to tension, which brings me back to my conceptualization of truth as a common epistemological solidity that takes into account and simultaneously transcends history, context, and positionality. And I can explain this through the difference between speaking fact to power and speaking truth to power. Speaking fact to power doesn't make any sense, right? The reason is precisely because a fact is, I, I would say, a solid statement outside of history, context, and positionality. Taking into account history, context, and positionality is what causes internal tension with regards to solid and common knowledge. But that is precisely the point and the challenge, you know, and the eternal search, you know, for ethnography, obviously. Ethnography is well placed to come in here. After all, focusing on history, context and positionality is precisely what ethnography is good at. So an ethnography that embraces the dialectical epistemological tension between solid ground and shifting sand is precisely what can function as an antidote to post-truth. And it can do so in many, many circumstances. But a central argument of this lecture is that it would become even more productive if it is focused on or related to power by being explicitly focused on speaking truth to power. And whether anthropology should do that or not, how and why, and who should do so, is perhaps a question we can discuss further today. Thank you.